right, good evening, everyone. All right, we have an early celebration of Memorial Day. We have a few hymns in that theme. Let's go to 601, a patriotic song, God of Our Fathers. Let's go ahead and stand together as we sing 601, God of Our Fathers, whose almighty hand leads forth in beauty all the starry band. Praise the Lord for our country. Praise the God for our freedoms that we have today. And those who gave their lives as well as those who are serving today. Good to have several visitors sprinkled around here tonight. Great to have you here tonight on this Memorial Day weekend. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And then we'll let you have a seat for some announcements. Father, we thank you that as the saved, as the redeemed, those who've been born again, have trusted and received eternal life through Jesus Christ, that Lord, you are our Father. And Lord, we're thankful that we've been adopted into your family. And Lord, have full inheritance, the same as your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the righteousness of Christ given to us, Lord, at salvation. We thank you, Lord, for our country. Lord, I pray that we know our history, our heritage. I pray we know uh, those that came, Lord, for religious freedom. And Lord, we're so grateful for your hand upon this country as we look back in history and see God's providence. And Lord, we certainly, as believers, should be uh, grieved over our country's condition spiritually, Lord, not just of the lost, but those that call themselves God's people, and the church, and the redeemed. And Lord, help us to be what we ought to be. Help us, Lord. We want to pray for revival among God's people. We want to be, Lord, biblically based in all that we do. And I pray, Lord, we would be true light in this dark land. We certainly pray, Lord, you would be working among our president, our leaders, those that represent the people, Lord, we thank you for those who are strong believers, even in government. And we pray that you would strengthen them, Lord, and encourage them to do that which is right and pleasing according to the word of God. Thank you, Lord, for, again, all of those in the years past who have faithfully served for our freedoms, who have died, perhaps, Lord, for our freedoms that are serving right now. And, Lord, may we not forget. We thank you again for the privilege that we can have right now to gather, Lord, and freedom of religion, freedom to press, freedom of many things that we have in America, Lord, and we thank you for that. Lord, may you be honored and glorified by all that's done tonight in the service, in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. You may have a seat. Well, we'll take our songbook so you can remain seated, but turn to 590, if you will. 590. We're going to sing Sound the Battle Cry. stand as our men come for tonight's offering. Let you stretch your legs here just for a second. We have our young men on the final Sunday of every month uh, receive the offering, serve the Lord there. Uh, right after the offering, I'm going to have uh, two of our men go call it Preacher's Report, all right? We're going to have Nathan come on up here and start us off. Just give a quick uh, two, three minute, all right, uh, import where he's been the last two Sundays, maybe what he's preached on, what God's laid on his heart, and just give an account. Uh, another church in the area that uh, is standing for the things of the Lord and what uh, he observed, maybe some decisions, perhaps not. And we'll have Shane come up. He's been preaching a lot, several places. He'll give a little report of where he's been, what God's done, and we, we don't base them on decisions made. We understand we don't always know what those are, but we'll let these men uh, give a chance. Many of you have prayed for them, and so it's always good to hear then where they've been and what God has done. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you again for the opportunity to receive uh, a love offering, uh, tithes and offerings. This is whatever you lay in our heart, Lord. We use it for your honor and glory. Thank you, Lord, for these young men. We pray they be walking with you, Lord. Use them both now and in the future for your honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.
Pastor Teddy asked me to just kind of give a brief update since you may not have seen me the last two Sunday mornings and I had to skip out last Sunday uh, for Jackie. But last two weeks I've been up at uh, Lake Sheridan Bible Chapel uh, up just south of Nicholson. If, unless you're talking to somebody north of Nich Nicholson, it's on our side, not their side. That got confusing in the directions I was getting. But there's just a pastor there that's been there. Uh, Jim Wentz has been there, I think, about 20 years, he said. But last couple of weeks has been struggling with a, some kind of issue with his tongue. He's been difficult to, to hear, difficult to get speak and such. And when you're a pastor, that's a challenge. Um, and so he had contacted Pastor Cremard and said, hey, can you come? And as we all know, Pastor Cremard's booked up till you know Christmas of 2050. <laughs> And so he sent me a, a name, he sent my name and, and Shane and was like, if either of you would be available. So I sent back to Pastor Wentz and said, if you could use me. And so I was up there uh, last week for the first time and never been in that church as far as I'm aware. Uh, and the pastor was there. Now that's a little nerve wracking when you've never been in the church. Shane probably knows. You've never been in the church, never met the pastor and you're filling his pulpit. He was a little nervous, but uh, they, they let me come back, so I guess it wasn't too bad. Uh, spoke last week on a passage that everybody's probably read, but maybe you're not familiar with, because uh, I know I wasn't too familiar with it when I first started studying it, and that was in Judges uh, chapter 17 and 18, and dealing with a man and his counterfeit Christianity. Now, obviously, the Old Testament didn't have Christianity, but that was what I titled it, and uh, counterfeit Christianity and how we can easily fake it and, and do other things. And this week looked at the Old Testament again, in, in this time in First and Second Kings, with stories of oil and how God used oil for the faith of two, uh, two widow women. One dealing with Elijah, maybe you're familiar with, but... The other one, maybe not as much, dealing with Elisha and, and the woman. And so it was a good time up there. In fact, one of the ladies said, I'm still thinking about your counterfeit stuff that we talked about last week. Um, so that was an encouragement. That it's, it, sometimes it's a familiar passage, sometimes it's not. But uh, you know, there's always things that we can learn and, and things that we can study. And sometimes those passages that we haven't looked at too deeply are the ones that we probably should spend more time in because they're all all valuable. So thankfully, the pastor has been doing better. In fact, last week he asked me, he's like, I hope you can understand me. And I said, yeah, because uh, I didn't know what the issue was at the time. And I'm like, yeah, I can understand you just fine. Uh, uh, come to find out that was the issue. But he's doing a lot better. Uh, he's looking forward to being back in his pulpit. Hopefully, uh, He's got somebody scheduled else for next week, but hopefully the week after he's hoping to be back in and with his therapy and doing well. Uh, and we're praying for that. Amen. And we've been gone. Katie and I have been out and about. Uh, we were in Mishapin last Sunday through Friday. And so we had week-long meetings there, the Lord blessed. Uh, Sunday morning, there was a, a young lady with, with two little kids I believe her name is Chelsea, and uh, she trusted Christ as Savior that morning, and uh, so they were greatly rejoicing. They've been praying for her. She'd been attending once in a while, uh, was not saved, but that morning, as uh, she raised her hand and asked if she'd like to talk with Pastor White, she smiled real big and shook her head yes, and she went back with the pastor's wife, and they went back there for a little while and talked about things and went over the gospel again, and she trusted Christ as Savior. And uh, she was rejoicing, and so was pastor in the church, and so we're very excited for that. Good decisions throughout the week as well there for meetings. And then uh, Katie, the day before we started the meeting, so not, this, not yesterday, but the Saturday before, she spoke at a ladies' luncheon that they were having there. And I uh, did a great job with that there. I got to be there and uh, fellowship with Pastor as the girls were doing their thing, you know. And then, uh, then we went straight from Saturday to Sunday through Friday. And then yesterday we were in, at Elkdale Baptist Church with Pastor Bissell up there. And Katie was speaking again at a different ladies' uh, little seminar they were having there and did a wonderful job about being lights 
And uh, so thankful for that. And then I was preaching in there this morning as well and thankful for good decisions made. And so we just rejoice that where we go, the gospel's still going out. People still trust in Christ as Savior. Uh, sometimes we get discouraged by what's going on in the world, but there is still a remnant of those that have not bowed their knee to the devil. And so thankful for those and thankful to be here tonight with everyone. So let's go ahead and take our songbooks now, if you will, and let's turn to 602. Let's go ahead and stand one more time, and let's sing for God so loved the world. Let's sing it through twice. 602. We're going to ask you to go ahead and find your place. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open it to Ruth chapter 1. Ruth chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, you just grab one of these pew Bibles right in front of you there. should be pretty easy to find. Ruth is the eighth book of the Bible, page 420, if you need to use one of the pew Bibles. Page 420. All right, Ruth chapter 1. We are continuing. This is our third week as we began a new study on the book of Ruth. Short little book, four chapters. Very familiar to most people, but uh, finding some truths that God would have from the book. I appreciate uh, hearing from Nathan and Shane, uh, pastor this morning, preaching in uh, different places and locations. I hope you faithfully lift them up in prayer. Encourage them in the Lord as they are away. And if you are one of the parents of the Tykes for Truth, I did announce this last week. I want to announce it again that uh, we're transitioning. My wife is, uh, I think this might be her last Sunday or next Sunday is her final Sunday. And Miss Karen and Sharon Kempa have been helpers. Miss Karen is going to be taking that over and be the main teacher. And Miss Sharon uh, Kempa is going to be her helper. My wife is going to be transitioning to the Wednesday night kids program. And that's always exciting when you have some folks that step in and are trained for a year or two and then ready to take it over. Now, it can be intimidating for them, a little bit nervous. I'm sure Mike's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, but you know, that's good. The Bible says we're supposed to teach others, and it's time for them to take the reins. Let them say, hey, I can do it with the Lord's help. It's not of my spirit or my eloquence or lack of or trade. It's of God. I'm a vessel, and I, God can use me. So we're excited about that. Miss Karen just recently been saved a few years and serving the Lord, and that's exciting. And so she'll be uh, taking that over. Be keep her in your prayers, and my wife uh, will be helping with some of the Wednesday nights, starting with the summer program, all right? All right, Ruth chapter 1 is where we're at. I think everybody's here. You found your places, I trust. You may not have been with us. We have, again, several visitors. So good to see Miss Taylor here. All right. I missed her. I think she was here on Easter, and I was sick with pink eye and didn't get a chance to see her there. We have some ladies back here that are visiting as well, and a family here. Many of you have got to know them. They've been with us before, and uh, good to have all. I may have missed somebody, but good to have each of you here. Let's go ahead and read. We're going to read the first uh, five verses. We'll have a word of prayer, and we're going to jump into this. All right. Ruth chapter 1. Verses 1. Now, we've looked at 1 to 5. This is the third week in a row we've looked at these verses. We're, we'll be in the whole chapter. Uh, Lord willing, to start in chapter 2 next week. But uh, we want to uh, still focus on the central truth the Lord has laid in my heart. So, whether you've been with us or not, let's pick up the first five verses. Ruth chapter 1. Now, it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled. Paul's right there. We looked at this last week. Nathan uh, preached a little bit from judges he mentioned. As you know, the theme of the book of Judges is 
Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That's repeated several times. There was no king in Israel. There was no standard. There was no rule. There was no uh, level of biblical living. So every man did that which was right in his own eyes. So that's the setting of this story. And you're going to see what happens when a man did that which was right in his own eyes and how it affected his family. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. Most of last Sunday's service was examining famines from the Bible. What are famines? What does it mean when God sends a famine? Judgment, testing, proving for God's people. There was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab. He and his wife and his two sons. We'll stop there for just a second. We looked at this. We're going to find out the man's name and his wife's name and his son's name. And we're going to see what happened when that famine came, that time of judgment, that time of testing and proving. This man, I'm sure, made a decision that his eyes was right. Unless we be too hard, let's remember, this man would have only had access to the first six books of the Bible. Not perhaps personal. It didn't mean he would have had his own copies. It was very much time where there was no king, no standard. Some of the judges were good, godly. Many were not. Every man did that which is right in his own eyes. You sort of made a decision and just, I think this is right. I'm going to do it. A lot of people do that today. Didn't have a lot of scripture. He had limited light, but he did have light. And he made a decision that he might have thought made sense and was right for him and his family. We're going to leave Bethlehem, Judah which means house of bread, praise. We're going to go down to Moab. Verse 2, and the name of the man was Elimelech. His name means my God is king, Jehovah. And the name of his wife, Naomi, her name means pleasant. And the name of his two sons, Malan and Chilion, which means sick, piney, unhealthy, not sure again. Perhaps they were, had physical challenges even from birth. And they were Ephratites of Bethlehem, Judah. That was their tribe. That was their region. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. We looked at that last week. We're not going to repeat all this. Sojourn in verse 1 means they were just going to go temporarily. They weren't planning to go long. It was a short stop. Just go down there, get our feet back, get a little bit of money. We're not going to live there. We're going to rent. Yeah, but by the time you get to verse 2, it says they continued there. That's more permanent. That's maybe no longer renting, that's buying a nice home, and well, we can stay a little bit longer than we thought. Verse 3, and Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left and her two sons. Now, lest we read in the scripture what's not there, we're never told that he died due to God's judgment. It very well could be. God doesn't tell us that, so we're not going to condemn the man. It doesn't tell us why he died. He could have been older. We don't know anything, but he did die, and he died in Moab. And so now his wife's a widow, but she has her two sons. Verse 4. Now, it is interesting that verse 4 comes after verse 3. Isn't that, isn't that incredible? You came tonight. Verse 4 is after verse 3. But isn't it incredible that it, the boys did not marry Moab women until dad died? Well, maybe I'm reading into that. Maybe he tried to keep as much of the Hebrew religion and relationship with Jehovah as he could and Maybe he wasn't going to let that happen, but it simply, simply says that, verse 4, and they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelled there. There's that third word, sojourn, continued, dwelled. Dwelled means permanent residence. They dwelled there about 10 years. Whoa! I guarantee you, when they first started talking about it, there was no way they were going to stay there even one year. It was going to be a very short trip down. We're not living there. We're not going to let the Moabites affect us. But there's a famine where we live. There's no food. We don't have any food. There's no crops. We've got to go to Moab. Things are fine there. The weather, the rain, the crops, they have an abundance. We're just going to sojourn there. That seemed right in their own eyes. That seemed proper. It made sense. Other people probably said, I'm with you. Other people may have already gone. And they went there, but after 10 years or so, we have a woman who is a widow. Her husband died and her two sons died. How do you know that? Verse 5, and Malan and Chilion died also, both of them. 
Somewhere toward the end of those 10 years, we're not told exactly, they died. We're not told why they died. It could be that they'd always had health problems based on their names. We're not told it was judgment of God. It could have been. But they both died, and the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Let me ask you ladies especially, if this was you ladies. You, you look in the mirror. We don't know how old she was. You had a husband. He's dead. You had two sons. They're dead. You used to live in Bethlehem, Judah. You're in Moab. You've been there for 10 years or more. We have two daughter-in-laws. They're nice girls, and they're sweet girls, and they love her, and she loves them, but they're Moabite women. We're never told that they have left what they believed or were raised on, necessarily. And you're down in Moab. What are you going to do? What are you thinking about? Well, we're going to get to that here today. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, you chose to give us this story. It's inspired of you took place during the time of the judges when there was no king, no standard, no biblical rule. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Lord, we live in a time today where that's very much common, certainly among the lost, but even among God's people, where they just sort of do what's right in their own eyes. Whatever happens, happens. Lord, I pray you'd show us some truths from this story that you've given us. May your Holy Spirit lead us and guide us and teach us. And Lord, may we be determined to be in your will, no matter what happens. Lord, speak through me, I pray tonight, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you're taking notes, a simple title, Bethlehem Judah or Moab? Bethlehem Judah or Moab? Would you rather be in Bethlehem Judah during famine... Or would you rather be in Moab during harvest time, or it's good? If you had to choose as one of God's people, would you rather be in Bethlehem, Judah, during a famine, but where the presence of God is, or would you rather be in Moab, where there's plenty? That's what we're going to look at here tonight. The Bible says in Proverbs 14, 15, many of you can quote it, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man. There is a way that seems right. It makes sense. It's logical. It fits on the paper. Others may agree. It's, it just seems absolutely the right thing to do. But Proverbs finishes, but the end thereof are the ways of death. There's a way that seems right. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Now, here's the problem. If every man did that which was right in his own eyes, who's defining right? The government, society, culture, your friends, your heart. Who determines what's right? There, there's no standard. I mean, that's why everybody, it's chaos. That's why you read the book of Judges, and you're like, what's going on here? I mean, hey, yeah, yeah, a lot of it don't make sense. This is, what, that's terrible, Exactly. We live in a society in much of the world where everybody does that which is right in his own eyes. There's no standard of living. Truth is what you want it to be. You perceive it's true. As long as you think you're okay, then you do it. Don't force anybody else. There's no absolutes. There's no real absolute right and wrongs. And so that was what was going on in these days. And we're, we're, God chooses this story, a true story of a true family, to show us some spiritual truths. Bethlehem, Judah, or Moab. Now, couple things to remember. The Moabites were not Canaanites. Sometimes uh, I and others may, we may think that. Ah, the Bible clearly said in the Old Testament, they're not to have any marriage among Canaanites or anything. Well, Moabites were never Canaanites. Uh, the Edomites were never Canaanites. The Ammonites were never Canaanites. All right? And so th those are different groups. Now, they're always referred to as Israel's enemies, there's nothing good really said about those. We just looked on Wednesday night at the book of Obadiah, written to the Edomites, descendants of Esau. Moab, descendants of Lot and his daughter. And the Ammonites, descendants of Lot and his other daughter. So tied back together, interrelated with Abraham. But they never were Canaanites, and they never lived in Canaan, if you look at your maps. 
You'll notice that Edom is below the Dead Sea. To the right of Edom, which we would say east, is Moab, and right above that is Ammonite. They're on the, what we would call the east side of the Jordan. They weren't in Canaan. They weren't the Canaanite nations that God said to destroy in the books of Numbers and Deuteronomy, or not to marry, not to have anything to do with them. So we're going to be careful that we understand that. Moabites were never Canaanites. They were descendants of Lot and his daughter. But if you look at your map, it'll make perfect sense by looking at the map and you'll understand exactly why Elimelech made his decision. Moab was not that far off. In fact, there were three tribes that had chosen to stay on the east side. Manasseh, Gad, and Reuben. Reuben bordered Moab. Not that far of a journey. If you look in your map and you find Bethlehem, all you got to do is go through a couple more tribes, cross over the Jordan River, over to the other side, go down through Reuben, which is still one of the 12 tribes, and just a little bit below Reuben is Moab. Not that far away. Not going, we're not going too far away. We're not going that far from God's will, necessarily. It's close. It's fairly simple. It's not that far away, and there's no famine there. We're looking tonight at the theme of God's will. It may have seemed like a really simple step to take, not that far away. And again, all they planned to do was sojourn there. We're not going to dwell there. We're not going to, we're not going to, don't worry about it. It's not gonna, they're not going to affect us. But we know what happened. They continued, they dwelt there three deaths later, ten plus years later. Can you say anything good came out of that move? Bethlehem, Judah means house of bread, praise. It's going to represent God's will. Hopefully you would say, I want to be in God's will no matter what happens. <laughs> I'm staying in Bethlehem, Judah, even if there's a famine. Now, everything about me may want to flee. Everybody around me may be saying, get out of there. But that's God's will, Bethlehem, Judah. And as a child of God, every child of God should want to stay in God's will. So I want to ask you a question tonight. Everybody, right now, everybody looking this way real quick. Don't answer for anybody else. Don't answer too quick, but answer truthfully. Are you right now in the center of God's will? Are you right now in the center of God's will? Exactly where he wants you, with the right spirit and right attitude, with his blessing. It doesn't mean there's not hard times and tribulation in God's will. Are you in Bethlehem, Judah, right now? Have you left Bethlehem, Judah? Are you thinking about leaving Bethlehem, Judah? As Moab is going to look enticing, they've, they've got rain down there, they've got big crops, they've got jobs, there's money. Now, it's not where God is, it's not where God's people are, it's, and it's not God's will. That's not where you should go, but it's, it's going to look like where you should go. It represents the world, it represents the flesh. You know what you're going to learn from the book of Ruth? And I'm not the first preacher to say this, but it's very true. Anytime you leave God's will, you're going to experience loss. You're not going to come back with what you're left with. And depending how long you stay out of God's will, will determine just how empty you come back. Elimelech. I think was a good man, an honest man, a hardworking man. I think he loved his boys. I think he loved his wife. He did what most of us would do. But he did the wrong thing. And he went to Moab, and they stayed there. And he died, and his boys died. Now there's a, a woman named Naomi who looks a lot older than she should be. She's aged, though her age is not as old as she looks, and She's got a decision to make. Do I stay in Moab? Do I just live with the wrong decision? Or do I go back to Bethlehem, Judah? Empty, almost. We looked at this verse last week. Psalm 84, 10b says this, I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. I would rather be a doorkeeper, just a lowly servant, now, we know there's no lowly servants if you're with the Lord, but I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God, where God is, than to dwell in the tents of the wicked, 
where there's great abundance. I hope every one of God's people would say that. Oh, I'd rather be in the center of God's will, even in a famine, than in the tents of the wicked, the Moab. I don't know what will happen. Now, before we move on, because I want to get to Naomi tonight, one other thing about the boys. It says they married two women of Moab, verse 4. Now, I mentioned they weren't Canaanites, and that's true. However, I want you to notice something from the Old Testament. So if you'll just hold your spot here, you won't go back far. Go to Deuteronomy 23. Deuteronomy 23. And we're going we're gonna to visit Deuteronomy 23 again in future lessons because it's an important little verse or two. And it's going to answer maybe a question you're going to have later on about Ruth. So the boys didn't necessarily break Old Testament law concerning Canaanite marriages. But there was scripture already that Elimelech would have known, I would assume, we assume, I could be wrong, that would have given all the information we needed about marrying these girls. Deuteronomy 23 in the Law of Moses, God deals with something, and I want you to notice verse number 3. Deuteronomy 23, 3. An Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to their tenth generation shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever. Wow. Why? Because they met you not with bread and with water in the way when you came forth out of Egypt. And because they hired against thee Balaam, the son of Peor of Pether of Mesopotamia, to curse thee. Nevertheless, the Lord thy God would not hearken unto Balaam. But the Lord thy God turned the curse into a blessing unto thee, because the Lord thy God loved thee. Thou shalt not seek their peace, Ammonites and Moabites, nor their prosperity all thy days forever. And by the way, just so we know, verse 7, thou shalt not abhor an Edomite. So God puts the Ammonites, the Moabites, and the Edomites in a different category. They weren't the Canaanites. And there were some different rules and regulations for the Jews and them. Now, we're not going to get into that deep detail because you may have some questions about those verses, and you should if you read that. What does that mean, that don't let them in the congregation of the Lord? What does that mean that to the 10th generation? I thought God is a God of forgiveness. Wait a minute. What about Ruth later on? <laughs> wait a minute. Ruth was mowed by. We, we know the end of the story. So wait a minute. If the boys did wrong, what about Boaz later on? Well, we're going to get to that. All right. But I want you to notice that was a clearly written in the law of Moses, these young men were not in God's will. Horpah, Ruth, they've been beautiful, attractive women, kind, gentle, honest, loving, polite, but they were not what they should have married. They wouldn't have, of course, if they weren't down there, but they did. They wrote wrong choices. Both boys die. <sighs> now we pick it up in verse number six. Then she, that's Naomi, arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. Hey, she's made her decision. By the way, it's a good decision. It's the right decision. I'm going back to Bethlehem, Judah. Now, sure, her motives not, may not be pure, but I'm returning. I'm going to return. By the way, that's always the answer if you're not in God's will. Return to God's will. Return to when you left it. When was the last time you were in God's will then and you had the peace of God? If, if you're right now tonight, you were honest. Maybe you were brutally honest. I hope you were. There's no, no need lying. God already knows. You're like, no, I'm not in the center of God's will. All right, how long have you not been in it? How long have you not had his blessing? How long have you not had his peace, his joy? How long has it been? You say, well, you've got to think back deeply. You can't be generic. You can't say, well, it's been a while. No, no, no. When did you step out of God's will? You've got to go back there. You might have stepped out of God's will because you withheld forgiveness. And so you've been bitter and angry. You're not in God's will. You can come to church all you want, put all the money in the offering. You're not in God's will. All right? You're living in sin. Why? When did that happen? You've got to go back to that. You've got to get, confess that. You've got to forsake that. You've got to be honest with that. You've got to return. You've got to make them, if you, you've, you have a broken relationship. You've got to get that right. What does God say to do? You may have to go to someone. You may have, whatever it is, you've got to go back to where was it when you were last in Bethlehem, Judah, and why are you not anymore? Now you've got to make those things right. You've got to get back where God wants you to go. And she says, I'm returning. I'm going. 
I'm going to go. Verse 6. Now here's why it says. She had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Now, that may not be a pure motive. We're going to look at that a little more. But uh, she's tired of Moab. She has bad memories of Moab. There's three grave sites in Moab. Plus, I hear the famine's over. I'm going back to Bethlehem, Judah. Verse 7. Wherefore, she went forth out of the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return. There's that where you'll see that word return many times. We're going to return to the land of Judah. Now, it appears from verse 7, if we read into it a little bit here, that the daughter-in-laws are fully prepared to go with her the entire way. They're related. They have no children that we know of, and they are, that's family. They're going with her. I mean, they're lock-loaded. We're headed with you. You're the only family we have as far as through marriage. And they go, and it appears around verse 8, it's likely that maybe they come to the border. Maybe they come to the tribe of Reuben. Maybe they're getting ready to enter into what we would call Israel or Jewish land. And she probably says, ladies, and this is what she says, verse 8. Go, return each to her mother's house. You, ladies, I, I love you. You no need to come with me. You go ahead back to your mother. You're young. You can still marry again. I appreciate your faithfulness. You're like daughters to me, but you're from Moab. Your family's in Moab. Your customs are in Moab. Everything you know is in Moab. You, you don't need to go with me. Return unto your mother's house, and the Lord deal kindly with thee, as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that ye may find rest, comfort, each of you in the house of her husband. And then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. It was time for a full time, go back home. It's okay. I'll be fine. But they said unto her, verse 10, Surely we will return with thee. And no, no, we're with you. We're not going back. Now I want to look at these last oh, 10, 15 minutes. I want us to look at Naomi tonight. I want us to look at her backslidden state. Because if you're not in God's will, you're, if you're a child of God and you're not in God's will, you're backsliding right now. You're currently backsliding and you have been. You're not where God wants you. You're not where he has you. You don't have his hand of blessing, not blessing as far as everything's prospering necessarily, but that's not where God has you. You're not where he wants to be. You're not experiencing that. I, I want to look at three things here that show Naomi's backslidden state. She's gone from pleasant to bitter, right? Don't call me pleasant. Don't call me Naomi. Ugh. All right. Number one, I want us to notice her wrong counsel to her daughters-in-law. You know, when you're backslidden, you're going to give wrong counsel. <laughs> He said, well, what wrong counsel did she give her daughters-in-law? Well, verse 8, go return. Verse 11, and Naomi said, turn again, my daughters. Verse 12, turn again, my daughters. Verse 15, behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people. She's speaking to Ruth and unto her gods. Return, Naomi, what is wrong with you? Now, some of you are here today and you're saying, that's fine, that's good advice. What's wrong with that? That's wrong counsel. Four times she says, no, go back to Moab. Now, that may seem innocent. Go back to your people. Here she says to Ruth, go back to your gods. Now, what person walking with God and God's will would tell another person who may not know God to go back to your way of living and do what's best for you. Now, that may sound nice and it may hit emotional people, but that's not God's will. God's will would be for what? What's the greatest need in these two young ladies' lives at this moment? Now, we're, we're going to reveal later on. We know what Ruth says, but at this stage, we don't know if these ladies are believers. I know that's not the word in the Old Testament. We don't know if they believe in Jehovah. We don't know if they've left the gods of Moab. We don't know anything about their spiritual condition. We just know right now they're, they're good daughter-in-laws. They love their mother-in-law, and they want to go with her. And Naomi, who knows the true God Jehovah who knows the only way, why would she not want her daughter-in-laws to also know that same God? What would make you say, no, go, and, and not just once or twice, but go back to your gods. Go back to your culture. Now, it may seem to be right. Pastor Boyer, but if they go with her, they're going to be widows their whole life. Who's going to marry them? What Jewish person is going to marry a Moabite woman? 
they're going to be ostracized and outcast and, and treated maybe bad. We already know what Deuteronomy says about Moabites. You think they're going to have a good life? Wouldn't it be better for them to go back to Moab? Well, you, let, let me ask you, would it? If that's your reasoning, you need to renew your mind. You're thinking like a lost person. You don't have eternity's values in mind. You let the world slip in and you're making, that's not what's best for these young ladies. Go back home, great. They go back home, they marry two Moabite men, they raise a family, and it looks like they have a great life, and then they die without knowing Jehovah. Is that what was best for them? But you know, a lot of God's people make decisions based on emotions for their friends and family, and they give wrong counsel. And they give it thinking it's best for them. No, I love the definition. I remember this from a high school Bible curriculum. Love, a biblical definition of biblical love, is that which always seeks God's best or God's will for the person loved. There's your definition of love, not what the world says. If I love somebody, my spouse, my children, my friends, if I really love them as a believer, then I want God's best and God's will for their life. And therefore, the decisions I make have to be in line with that. Anything else is really not love. Go home to your people and your gods. I know that sounds good. That's good, but they're going to be happy. They're going to have a good life. They're going to die without Jehovah. They're going to go to hell. How's that best? And as parents and as friends, we're here to give the best to our children and our family. Not what may always seem, well, they're not going to like me. They're not going to like us. What's best for them? What's God's will for them? God's will, you say, but go home to your gods. Go home to your gods. They're false gods. They're going to be scars the rest of your life. You're going to be empty. You know what she should have been saying? Girls, I'm so glad you want to come with me. Now, girls, I know it's not going to be easy, but God can do it. I want to introduce you to Job. Now, I think they've been introduced to Job. I think they've been affected by that, and we know that with Ruth. But when you're in a backslidden state and you're not where God wants you, Usually the Bible stays closed a lot. You begin to make decisions like everybody else in the land. Everybody does that which is right in your own eyes. That seems like a good thing. Girls, I appreciate it. It's a long, it's a long trip. No one's going to, it's not going to be easy. It'd be better for you to go back home, enjoy a good life, good job, among your own people and your own gods, than to go with me. No, you just get, go, go, go. What? She said, it'd be better for you to come with me and know God, Jehovah, experience his blessing. See all that he has for you than to stay in Moab. You know, Naomi had lost her vision and burden for people, didn't she? You're going to find out when you're backslidden, you'll lose your vision and burden for people. In fact, you really won't even think about other people. You certainly won't think about them in light of eternity and what God's best for them is. You'll make decisions just based on what's best for me, them, so we get along, or anybody be angry with me. Usually wrong counsel comes from being out of God's will because you're not really in tune with what God's word says. Number two, how do we see her backslidden state? We see her wrong view of God. Not only does she give wrong counsel, she had a wrong view of God. Now, I want to give Naomi credit. And again, I'm, I'm not trying to jump on her too hard. I have no excuse. I have the entire word of God. I have the Holy Spirit permanently living within me as a believer. I have the church which God has designed, the pillar and ground of the truth. I have a Christian upbringing, Christian school, Christian college. I have every opportunity, absolutely. She didn't have that. She had some light, but it was limited. She made some bad decisions. Her husband wasn't there to guide her, though he had made a wrong decision. Her sons were not there. She does what many of us do. She is not in God's will. She gives wrong counsel. Now she has the wrong view of God. Now I want to give her credit. She does talk about the Lord, though, doesn't she? She's not just giving up on God. Eight times you're going to see her talk about the Lord. Verse 6, the Lord visited his people. Verse 8, the Lord deal kindly with you. Verse 9, the Lord grant you that you may find rest. Verse 13, at the end of it, the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. Now, we know that everything she's referencing doesn't mean she's walking with him, but she is thinking about Jehovah God. Never said her, dad, her husband said anything about the Lord. We never hear a boy saying anything about the Lord. But at least she's talking about the Lord. In verses 20 and 21, she has four times. The Almighty. The Lord, verse 21. The Lord, verse 21. The Almighty. Hey, Naomi, at least 
believes in Jehovah God and talks about him. Okay, she's not in God's will. She's in a backslidden state. She's giving wrong counsel. She doesn't have a, a, a view of her daughter-in-laws that she ought to have that God would have. She could go back to the law of Moses and see what God says about strangers. You say, well, I know, but what about the admonition for the Moabites? Maybe she thought she was doing the right thing, and she may have thought that. But she's talking about God, but she has a wrong view of God. Did you see how she spoke about the Lord? Praise God if you speak about the Lord. But there are a lot of people, when, the, when you really listen to what they're saying about the Lord, ooh, it's a wrong view. It doesn't match up with Scripture. Now, what does she say? She says in verse 8, the Lord, that's capital L-O-R-D, that's Jehovah God, Jehovah, deal kindly with you. Verse 9, Jehovah grants you, he's talking, talk, talking to the daughter-in-laws. But when you get to verse 13, look at she says. She's trying, she's trying with all her heart to talk them out of going with her. No, girls, no, turn back. There, there's no way. Based on Levitical law anyways, you would have to wait till a family member. If I had children, you'd have to wait years to marry them. To, and it, it's not going to happen. Forget it. Just go back home. And at the end of verse 13, she says, are you going to tarry for me till, if I have children? Even I'm too old to have them. Would you wait? Would you stay with them? Nay, my daughters, it grieveth, here it is, it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. I'm grieved. I'm bitter. I believe in God, but God has dealt harshly with me. A wrong view of God. He, he's, been, he's not been good. He's gone out. He, his hand's against me. Probably maybe said with a, a little bit of an upturned lip. Verse 2021, 20, look what she says. She comes back to Bethlehem, Judah, and everybody's like, Oh my goodness, it's Naomi. You've been gone for years. Is that Naomi? Naomi, it's so good to see you. Oh, Naomi, no. Don't call me Naomi. Don't call me pleasant. You call me Mara. Right? That Old Testament reference to the water, the bitter water with Moses. Oh, that water is Mara, bitter. You call me bitter. Now notice what she said about the Lord. For the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. Verse 21. By the way, here's the testimony. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought home, me home again empty. The Lord brought me back empty. Then why call ye me Naomi, seeing the, the Lord hath testified against me? He's, he's witnessed against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me. Hey, when you're not in God's will, and if you stay out of God's will, you'll give that same testimony. I went out full, and I came back empty. You're going to experience loss, loss of joy, loss of purpose, loss of peace, loss of lots of things. And you might have a wrong view of God. Yeah, well, God did this to me. It's God's fault. No, notice all the I's and me's. Against me and against me. And I went out and, oh, she has a wrong view of God. I believe Naomi used to have a tender heart. I think she matched her name. I think she was joyous. I think she was pleasant. I think she was the one you loved to be around. She loved Jehovah God. And even with all her backslidden state, she still talks about the Lord a lot, doesn't she? She just talks about it with no smile. A coldness, a deadness. A bitterness. You know, the Lord, the Lord. I, don't, I still believe in the Lord. I'm not an atheist. He's, it's his fault. He's, I went out. I had everything. Now look at it. No, no, no. Don't call me Naomi. I'm back home. And... Whoa. Naomi, have you forgotten? Again, not forgot, maybe not have been in here. We look back and we say, Proverbs, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. As a father, his son, whom he loves. The chastening of the Lord. If you're a child of God here today and you're not in his will, you are or will experience the chastening of God. God's chastening. You may say, why is God doing this to me? As a wayward child or a wayward sheep, before you ruin yourself, before you're, I'm going to chasten my children. Get back to where you need to be. Back to the shepherd. Back to the fold. Back to God's will. I know, but, a lot, well, but you're going to lose more if you stay out of that. You say, Pastor, what do you mean a wrong view of God? Well, is that a biblical view of God? Where does that come from? That's not, God dealt harshly. Is that what God does? 
God took my, maybe she said, God took my husband. He took my boys. That's not fair. Maybe that was her attitude. I can't believe God did that. He's, in one word, she says he's almighty. She has the idea he's sovereign. He rules. Yeah, but, he, but in a way, she's saying, no, he's not almighty. No, he's not. She's speaking backwards. She gave wrong counsel. She had a wrong view of God, and we'll finish with her wrong focus on herself. We looked at that. I went out. Me. No. You call me. Oh, my goodness. When you start talking always about yourself, not always a sign you're out of God's will, but it's a pretty good chance you forgot a lot about the Lord. By the way, can we just give a little truth nugget here? Don't always listen to what people tell you to do. <laughs> if Naomi was your friend and she said, don't call me Naomi again. Don't you see my Facebook? I changed it. It says Mara. I don't want to be called that. Too many memories. Plus, I, you don't have to listen to her. By the way, does anybody ever call her Mara in the book? <laughs> I don't see anybody calling her Mara. Even God doesn't call her Mara. Her name's always Naomi. I don't know, one person calls him or not. It doesn't matter what, some people may say, just leave me alone. Well, I need to leave him alone. They said, leave me alone. Is that best for him? Is that what God's will is? What does the Bible say? That doesn't mean there aren't times where a person needs to have some, but no, we don't, no, I don't want, don't, you don't need to do that anymore. <laughs> no, don't, well, 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 wait a minute. Well, they said that and I need to honor that. It's like, it's like being teenagers again. They, they said, swear you'll never, swear you'll never tell anybody. What? Always told teens that. that. Don't ever say that. You're not a friend. No friend does that. I promised I would not. Oh, and now they told you that they're going to commit suicide. But you're going to be a good friend and not tell them. What? That's not a friend. How's that a friend? A friend wants God's best. You say, no, I can't make those promises. I, I will be confidential. I'm not going to pass around. But if you tell me something that, it, you know, is going to fail, I've got to, I've got to, what? We sometimes make, we think we're honorable. Okay, I'm going to call her Mara. That's what she wants. All right. Well, that's not best for her. All right. Be careful. Be careful when people say things. And again, give people space. But if, if you know it's a person that's hurting and God's put you in their life for a purpose, you're there to influence them for the Lord. Well, they said not to. <laughs> they said, don't talk about the Lord. Hmm. Don't talk about the Lord. Well, does that mean every single time you come, you've got to ram it down their throat? Not necessarily, but does that mean, well, I promised I'd never talk about the Lord, and they don't want that. Well, is that, how's that going to help them necessarily? I know God can work out different ways, and you need to think, and there needs to be a proper way, and maybe you've done it wrongly, and you haven't prayed, but you don't always have to just because they said something. Call me Mara. I like it, the fact that we're never recorded. Anybody calls her Mara. Now, she said, I went out full and came home empty. True or false? Who's with her? Ruth. How would you like to be Ruth? Call me bitter. I went empty. Empty. Yeah. <laughs> I'm with you. We'll get to Ruth next week. I I'm with you. Where you go, I'll go. Where you lodge, I'll lodge. Where you die, I'll die. Your God will be my God. I, went, I came empty. That'll happen when you're out of God's will. All you don't think about is yourself. You don't think about you and all your problems. Well, you just have a, a Moabite woman who gave up everything to come with you, knowing what she was going to face, and who said to you, your God, Jehovah, my God. I don't want my gods. I want your God, and I'll come with you. And we know what, Ruth, and I'll work for you, and I'll labor for you, and I'll help you. I came home empty. No, Naomi, you're only looking at yourself. When you're out of God's will, you get pretty bitter. And all you think about is yourself, and it makes you more bitter. Now, I spend some time on that as we wrap it up, because as we continue through the book, chapters 2, 3, and 4, does Naomi change? In fact, she, she starts acting really like her name, doesn't she? Pleasant and joyful and bubbly. And she starts getting excited about setting up Ruth with Boaz. And all. Now, what happened to her? She got her eyes off herself and lived for others. 
Instead of just sitting around saying, well, I'm just going back to Bethlehem, Judah. At least I'll be back with some family. But I'm just going to... I can't tell you how often I see this. I'm sure pastor and I got to be aware it could happen to me. How many believers, believers have made wrong decisions in the past? All of us. How many believers have made wrong choices? All of us. And we know it. Nobody needs to tell us that. Now, you may have confessed and received forgiveness. I hope you have. But there may be some sitting here today you've not yet. And you're just you're still in Moab. You know you shouldn't be there. You know you made bad decisions. You know there's scars. You think back all the time and you beat yourself up for the bad things you should have done and you didn't do. And you may feel guilty and discouraged and empty. It's not going to get any better staying in Moab. You need to return to the Lord. You need to go back to the great physician. Let him apply the balm of Gilead. You need to go to God who's the great restorer. Who can restore, like David said, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Naomi right here looks like she's about to give up and just say, well, I'm going to at least go back home. And if I'm going to die, I'll die in Bethlehem, Judah. Have a few friends. I don't know. I'm going back home. She might have went for wrong motives, but let's give her credit. She returned. She returned. And God used Ruth and God used some others to draw her back to that God she talked about, but was more of just a distant person. If you're here today and you're not in God's will. And by the way, if you're a gossip, you're not in God's will. If you're a busybody, you're not in God's will. If you're angry, you're not in God's will. If you're bitter, you're not in God's will. If you withheld forgiveness, you're not in God's will. If you're participating in known sin, you're not in God's will. We, we don't have to pray about it. There's a lot of ways we know we're not in God's will. And if you're not in God's will right now today, I want to challenge you right now today, tonight, get out of Moab right now. You probably already know you're in Moab. And it's not as fun as you thought it was. At first it was okay. It was pretty neat. There's a little bit of pleasure and sin for a season. There, there's some enjoyment. You made the right choice, but you're not experiencing God's blessing. You're empty. You may be a little deep and you think it's too late. You need to get out of Moab. Get back to Bethlehem, Judah. Get back. Return to God and His will. He already knows what you've done. He already knows you've messed up. He's ready to restore. He can do it. All I know this, if you stay in Moab, you know what's going to happen? You're going to sulk. You're going to grow weary. Why even live? You're going to grow bitter and resentful and critical. And you're going to take others down with you. That's the worst thing. You're going to take others with you. You're going to pull down some other people. And you're going to get them to come to Moab because it makes you feel better. And that's not what God wants. You know, you know the remedy almost all the time for when you're always focused on yourself? is you, There's a higher purpose and that's living for God. Many people, now look, you may be in God's will, but you're still discouraged. That can happen. I'm not saying every time discouragement doesn't mean you're in God's will. You have to determine that with the Holy Spirit. You either have the joy of the Lord and the Holy Spirit confirming where you're at or you're not. But I know one thing, there's a lot of folks, and this could happen to me, it could happen to anybody, where you just start focusing on all the bad things and all the problems, and that's all you dwell on 24-7. Uh, the physical pain. Uh, the, the wayward people, the people who did you wrong, and that's all you think about all the time. And all it does is affect you and others, and it keeps you from doing what God wants, and that was Naomi. I'm praise God she didn't stay there. She's a changed woman by the end of the book, and she's no longer thinking of herself. And there's so many people that I know, I'm not talking about people who their, your health has gone to where you can't even attend church. But there's so many people, if you would understand that the, the key to changing your life beside Christ is doing something for the Lord. Realizing there's something bigger than you. The kids class. If you would pour yourself into that, you stop thinking of yourself. You'd be like, my goodness, there's boys and girls who need you. I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to visit them. I'm going to, every, you're, whoa. And you start going, wow, I've got my spark back. I've got my joy back. There's something more important. Wow, the shut-ins, I'm starting to, the, whoa. You begin to realize that, you know what? God has something for me, and I don't, I don't have time to even wallow in my <laughs> discouragement. I'm not taking anybody down with me. I don't get upset because they have joy, and they bother me. And so I'm going to go to them and try to get them to Moab to come with me. No. Serve the Lord. Minister. 
God has a purpose. I want to finish with a true illustration. We have, I had an old booklet that was, someone gave me. I think my father-in-law gave me a box of books, and I'm just getting around to digging them out. <laughs> and, I, and I found an old book 100 years ago. It says 50 missionaries that kids should know. So I started reading, and I found we did a little family devotion tonight, and I read about her. And she stuck in my mind. And I had never heard of her before. And I love missionaries, so I like finding ones I'd never heard of before. Her name was Amanda McFarlane. Now, maybe you have her poster in your house, all right? Amanda McFarlane. First female missionary to Alaska. Wow. First female missionary to Alaska, 1877. Now, if you know anything about history in Alaska, you know that wasn't even officially a uh, United States there. If, you ever, if you've been to Alaska today, it's a pretty rugged place. All right? That's why they still have real, uh, reality shows about Alaska. All right? They don't have them about all the states. All right? It's a rugged place up there with the, the weather. So I want you to imagine a single female missionary who is a widow woman because her husband of 20 years has died. Presbyterian woman whose husband was a Presbyterian pastor. They served the Lord in full-time ministry in the States, New Mexico for years. He dies. Now you're a widow. You've been married 20 years. What are you going to do? Just sit around and God took him too early. No children. She heard a man speak about the need to go to Alaska. She went. I mean, we're talking pioneer. I mean, I'm talking only white woman in Alaska. <laughs> we're talking Indians, Eskimos, savages. We're talking snow and cold and whoa. And, the, and if you read her little thing there, it says she poured herself so much into the ministry, she forgot how lonely and sorrowful she was. Because she was just sitting around seeing being so lonely. And, and those are real. And it's nothing wrong with experiencing that. But she said, I, I got up there and there was so much to do. She, you should read about her. She was a, she, a teacher. She shared the gospel. She was like a cook, a lawyer, uh, everything you can think about. And over time, she gave herself. Everybody came to know who that white woman was. Who told people about God. And the Indians. And people who threatened her life. There was a cause bigger than herself. God has something for me. And while I'm doing that, I, I don't, she said, I don't have time to get lonely. <laughs> I don't have time to realize I'm all by myself. God's got something for me, and I'm going to do it, and I'm going to do it as long as I can do it. Well, that challenges me. I don't face anything that she faced as a pioneer white woman, single female up in Alaska. Hey, I want to ask you a question tonight. Just, we asked, are you in God's will? If you're not in God's will, how long are you going to stay there? You think it's going to get better tomorrow? You think staying there an extra week will get better? You think it'll get better or get worse? You think it'll get harder to get right with God or easier the longer you wait? You think there'll be more scars or less scars? God's way is best. It's hard to do it sometimes, but like Naomi, how about we return to Bethlehem? Judah, heads bowed, eyes are closed. Just a simple invitation. If you're a child of God, you're saved. The Holy Spirit lives within you permanently. He's your paraclete, your comforter. He's the convictor. If you're a child of God and the Holy Spirit, did the Holy Spirit give you perfect peace tonight? Do you have the perfect peace and assurance that you're exactly where God wants you, doing exactly what He wants you to do with the right attitude and spirit? Or did the Holy Spirit of God maybe chasten you? Like a, a doctor who loves you and says, I don't want to see you suffer. Oh, this, ooh, that hurts, doctor. I know it hurts. It shouldn't hurt. That's an area you've got to get right. Well, here's the remedy. Has the Holy Spirit of God pricked your conscience tonight, pricked your soul tonight about an area? Maybe you're not right with God. Are you willing to get it right? Or are you going to leave here tonight? Just as the music begins to play, just a simple invitation. If you're in Moab, are you willing to return to Bethlehem Judah tonight? I mean, right now. I'm not talking about tonight at home. I mean, right now. Right now in the service. I know we have some visitors here tonight. I'm just preaching exactly where we're going through the book of Ruth. Didn't know, I don't know who's going to be here every night. I don't have any idea. I don't, know, I don't know one person in the room that's out of God's will that I could say I know it. The message was purely based on what the Holy Spirit laid on my heart. If the Holy Spirit of God applied it to you, it was God. He loves you. He doesn't want you to ruin your life. 
listen to that small voice saying, come back to me. Now, you may have to make some big decisions. You may have to get some things right with others. You may know exactly what it is. Maybe you have the perfect peace of God right now. Praise God right now. In my humility, I believe I'm where God wants me to be. And Holy Spirit did not reveal any sin, any wrong spirit, wrong actions, wrong attitudes. And God, keep me humble. Keep me on the right path. Let me bring others to Bethlehem, Judah. Let me not tell them to go back to Moab. If God spoke to your heart today in any area, tonight, just simply say, Pastor, God spoke to my heart. The Holy Spirit used that message in my life, and I want you to know that. Just write up, write back down. Just write up, write back down. Don't worry about anybody else. Just up, write back down. God spoke to my heart tonight. Would anybody be willing to have some courage and say, you know what? I'm not in the will of God, but I want to get there. And even now during the invitation, I've talked to the Lord. I asked him to forgive me and help me to get back to where I need to be. And I'm willing to do that no matter what it is. Is there anybody like that? It's hard to raise your hand. I understand that. Praise the Lord. I see that hand. Put that hand down. Thank you. Father, I preach what you laid on my heart. Lord, I've been out of your will. It's not pleasant, Lord. It first it seems okay we tend to fake it but lord it gets a hard life to fake it all the time to act like we have joy to act like everything is good oh god the joy of the lord just comes from obedience lord if there's anyone here tonight and we had some hands come up maybe some did not raise their hand lord if they've strayed if they're saved and they're not where they ought to be oh god in your love we know that you'll forgive them when they're honest with you may they be humble tonight and not proud lord if you've shown them anything specific Maybe there's some things they've got to get out of their life. Lord, maybe they've got to, there's some friends, some relationships. Maybe there's someone they've got to go to, a phone call, a visit, a talk right after the service. Someone they've lied to, someone they exaggerated to, someone that they deceived, uh, someone that they've been bitter, they've gossiped against, they've talked about them, Lord. Your spirit convicted them. They've got to get that right with that person. I pray they'd be willing to do that, Lord, not stay in Moab. Lord, thank you that you are the great physician and the great restorer that you can restore unto us the joy of our salvation. Now, Lord, if there's someone here tonight or watching that's not saved, Lord, their need tonight is to be born again, to experience true forgiveness through Jesus Christ, what he accomplished on the cross. Lord, I pray for someone here tonight or watching that's not saved, that they would call my wife or I, the Cremards, the Cole Myers. They'd stop and see us after the service, and we can help them. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness and goodness. Lord, I'm so grateful that we know the rest of the story. God, you used a Moabite woman, Ruth, for great things. God, Naomi didn't stay where she was. She was completely transformed. And we thank you for that. Lord, may we walk in the light of your word today. May we be exactly in the center of your will. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, the Lord bless you. Have a wonderful Memorial Day. Rain or not, enjoy yourself. Remember the freedoms we have. We'll see you on Tuesday night. You are dismissed.